Hello, my friends, and welcome to the NFRW Empower Hour. I am Gwyneth Chester, your host for the series that provides in-depth discussions on issues that are forefront in today's culture and gives you the tools to speak with authority on important topics in today's political landscape. Today's program is one that I think you will enjoy so much. I know I was really excited um, when we came up with it. Um, so I can't wait to dive right in. But first, happy belated new year. I, th I hope everyone had a wonderful holiday. Um, I hope you had the opportunity to rejuvenate because 2023 is going to keep us all very, very busy. Um, our program, I think, is perfect to start out the year um, because we're going to be talking about the U.S. Supreme Court. This is, of course, the highest court in our judicial branch and was meant to ensure a balance of power in our government. However, the court has become a hot topic and a political pawn in recent years. Um, we've seen everything from court decisions being leaked to the press, unheard of, right? Um, also, justices being picketed at their homes and harassed um, to court packing schemes and efforts to have justices removed because political parties didn't agree with their decisions. Um, and then there's the question of, is our court even serving the rule to which our founders originally intended it to? And that's a whole nother issue that I think you're really gonna be interested in. So before I get to our speaker, because I know you're, you're on the edge of your seat now as I am, we have to do our housekeeping. So please keep yourself muted throughout the program. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat as always. I will answer as many as we can at the end of the program. And of course, you can always reach out to me later if you think of something and I'll see what I can do to find the answer for you. Um, a huge thank you to Erica, um, who's helping me with tech and also to Kim, my rock stars behind the scenes that keep everything going because I'm usually a mess, especially when it comes to anything technical. Um, and also if you, haven't already, make sure that you're letting your clubs know that the past episodes of our programs are still available on the website. Just because 2022 is over doesn't mean that we've deleted all of the past episodes. We haven't. They're there um, to be a resource for your clubs. So just go into the NFRW resource library under programs and you'll find all of the Empower Hours there. So let's get to our guest. My guest this evening is the president of the Institute for Policy Innovation, Tom Giovanetti. The Institute is a free market policy think tank based in North Texas. Um, Tom has presented or represented IPI by testifying before both federal and state legislative hearings. He has been published in numerous magazines and newspapers and is a frequent guest on radio talk shows. He is generous with his time and his talent. He is one of my very, very favorite speakers, and I am honored to call him one of my friends. Tom, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I cannot tell you how excited I am to have you here talking to us. Um, so let's dive right in. Please, please, let's start by talking about um, the Supreme Court, and maybe let's start at the beginning with what 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 is the Supreme Court supposed to be? Thank you, thank you, Glennis. I I appreciate the invitation, and uh, I want you to know that uh, I think you're one of the most precious people in the world, and there's no hoop that that we would not jump through for you. Uh, I I love your organization. Uh, I love the fact that your organization is so serious about. Uh, informing and training people so that they can be effective activists. We have so many people out there that are flailing around these days, but they're not they're not informed and they're not trained. And so they make mistakes. And I think it's really uh, a lovely thing that that uh, the National Federation does is making sure that there's regular education opportunities available for your board and for your membership. Um, I, I want to just briefly explain that uh, the Institute for Policy Innovation is a 35-year-old conservative free market think tank. We were started by Dick Armey in 1987. Um, our website is one of those wonderful, easy, short URLs. It's ipi.org, so it's easy to remember. 
Uh, you can go to the website, you can sign up and you'll get notices about any of our new content that we produce. I am particularly proud these days of the two podcasts that we do. We record a weekly podcast just on current issues, which is good. And then we have, a, we have the one that is nearest and dearest to my heart, which is called IPI Policy Basics. And IPI Policy Basics, we're trying to build a library of podcasts on various policy topics uh, that are not bound in time. They have nothing to do with current events. Uh, it's a reference library where if you want to learn about a specific topic, you'll have a 20 to 30 minute podcast on that topic. So if you go to almost any podcast platform and just search for IPI, you can find our two podcasts. There, there's Again, there's the Institute for Policy Innovation podcast, and then there is the IPI Policy Basics podcast. And I know I'm biased, but I think those are really very, very remarkable resources. And so I would, I would, uh, if you're a podcast listener and you should be, because podcasts are really about the best way to, um, <laughs> to, to absorb information these days. I mean, I listen to podcasts when I'm driving, when I'm commuting, I listen to podcasts when I'm outside watering my, my trees. I listen to podcasts when I'm cleaning the kitchen. Um, so podcasts are a wonderful way to be gaining knowledge and information while you're doing something else. Uh, so if you're a podcast listener, uh, I, I would suggest that you at least check our podcasts out and see if they work for you. Well, I will concur with you on that. Um, the one that you recently did on the way that the house does business now compared to the way they used to do business now is fascinating and I had no idea because I was one of those people that wasn't really paying attention 20 years ago 30 years ago 40 years ago and have just started in the last 15 years really diving into this stuff so I, I was spellbound through the whole thing so please 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 get on ipi.org and just look at there's a deluge of information that you can just suck up and and learn so much. So I'm sorry, I won't interrupt anymore. Go ahead. No, no, you're 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 very kind. I mean, I hate to sound like an old man, but I do remember back when Congress used to work properly, and <laughs> so that's that is that is actually part of why we did that podcast is to sort of explain that uh, Congress really, you know, for literally for about ten, you know. Uh, this is not related to our presentation today, but so many of the people who are active today on the right came into the movement during the Tea Party era. And frankly, that was pretty recent, you know? I mean, if, if you really were never involved until the Tea Party era, there's like a whole wealth of knowledge and there's a whole wealth of the of the history of the conservative movement and conservative thought that you may not be aware of if, if if it was the tea party movement that sort of brought you into activism and so uh again i i i hate to sound like an old man but i long predate the the tea party movement and so we uh we we try to share as much of that perspective as we possibly can in our work and in our podcast so go to our website sign up, uh, check out the podcast. You can also donate on our website if you feel so moved. We appreciate that. Uh, I'm the guy who has to write the checks to pay the rent and to pay the salaries. And so people who come alongside me and help us to, uh, people frankly pay for, pay for the expenses of doing what we do are very important to me. So uh, you can do lots of those things on our website. So, so Glennis, I wanna talk about the Supreme Court, I want to talk about some of these current decisions, and I'm going to do it, frankly, in, an, in a logical order that doesn't make sense, but it's just sort of like in, in, in order of urgency. I, I, uh, I like to do things in sort of a very logical flow, and I'm going to violate that tonight because the first thing I want to do is, is give a little bit of an explanation about why we need to turn to reliable sources for our information. And then I'm going to talk about uh, some of the Supreme Court stuff. Now, Glennis, you and some of your board members have heard me do my long, long, long talk on judicial supremacy, why that's why that's a problem. And I'm going to touch on that tonight. I don't have time to do that whole thing tonight, but I'm going to touch on that tonight. Uh, so I, hopefully that will be hopefully that will satisfy your uh, desires there. Um, 
because of the reputation that my organization has and because of the reputation that I have, having done this for 35 years, we get really regular inquiries. There's not a week that goes by that I and some of my colleagues at IPI don't get emails where it'll be some new story or whatever, and they'll say, is this true? Is this right? Uh, should I trust this? Um, is this story accurate? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we live in an age where we're overloaded with information. We're just completely overloaded with information. I, I grew up in a time when there were three TV channels plus PBS. Now there's hundreds and hundreds of TV channels. Uh, I grew up in an era where if you were in a big city, you had two newspapers. If you were in a medium or small sized town, you had one newspaper. And now we have thousands and thousands of websites. And so the, we, we have an abundance of information, but figuring out what information is reliable, what information is not reliable is, is, is probably the greatest challenge of people who are living in this era. And I don't have time and IPI does not exist to be a full-time fact-checking organization, but we do try to be helpful where we can. And so when people send me stuff and they say, is this true? Is this right? Should I believe this? Should I be concerned about this? Da, 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 da. One of the first things I do is I look at the sources. And there are relatively reliable sources and there are relatively unreliable sources. And I think for those of us who want to be sophisticated consumers of information, and for those of us who want to be trusted sources, and all of you, all of you, are relied upon by other people in this area of politics and policy. That's why you have the positions that you have. And so all of us, you and I both need to need to become very sophisticated consumers of information. And so when someone sends you something, when someone is circulating something on social media or whatever, uh, one of the first things you should do is you should look and see what the source is. And there are sources that are reliable. There are sources that are unreliable. There are sources that are a mixture of both. Um, one of the first things that I look to is I ask the question, is this only being reported in, at one source or are there multiple sources that are reporting this story or this news? If a piece of news, if a piece of information is being reported by multiple sources, that's probably more reliable, that, that, that accrues to the benefit of reliability, as opposed to something that is only showing up on a single obscure website. So that should be one of your tests is, is this showing up from multiple sources or is this only coming from a single source? A another of your questions should be, is this source a, a source that is known to be reliable or is this a source that is known to be unreliable? And this is the first of many instances tonight where I'm liable to offend some of you because there are sources out there that are simply known to not be completely reliable. Uh, there's a website called Gateway Pundit. Uh, the guy who runs Gateway Pundit was one of the original bloggers, Jim Hoft. And one of the things that he found out was that it's hard to make money in blogging, but you could actually make a lot of money by getting people torqued up and by getting people sharing things on social media. And so Gateway Pundit, unfortunately has become a, 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 an unreliable source. Uh, some of the stuff that they run is good and accurate, but some of the stuff that they run is hyperbolic. Some of the stuff that they run is missing other perspectives, et cetera, et cetera. So if the only source for something is coming from Gateway Pundit or from some obscure website, you know, my reaction is always, I wouldn't have much confidence in this. There are other websites. There's a, there's a website called American Greatness, which sometimes runs good pieces and sometimes runs pieces that are hyperbolic and they're, that are inaccurate. Um, there's a Western journalism center that four years ago was purchased by someone else. And at that point, that website really changed. Uh, Western Journal was a fairly reliable website until about four years ago when it was purchased by someone else. And these days, there's, there's some information on that website that's true, and there's some information on that website that's false. So it's very tricky to 
figure out what are reliable sources and what are unreliable sources these days. But for those of us who, for those of us, and I include you all in this group, for those of us who are thought leaders, for those of us who people rely upon uh, for information, we have to be really careful about sources. And so I just want to start off by sort of urging you to be careful about your sources. Um, you know, I grew up in an era long before the internet, and you would, when you would be in the line at the grocery store, you would see these supermarket tabloids, right? You would see National Enquirer, you would see News of the World, and, you know, you, you would look at the cover, and there would be a picture of uh, Richard Nixon shaking hands with an alien, right? Uh, you, would, you would see a news story, Elvis is still alive, da-da-da-da-da. And you would look at those and you say, well, that certainly does not have the ring of truth about it. That is probably not true. But the question was always, so why do they do it? And sometimes when I have to tell people, you know, I wouldn't put much confidence in this story that you sent me because it's from an unreliable source. Sometimes they will respond and say, well, why would somebody purposely mislead me? Why would somebody send me something that's false or, or that is missing some perspective? And my answer to that is there has always been a business model for misinformation. And if you doubt that, again, remember back before the internet, back in the analog days, remember National Enquirer, remember News of the World, remember the pictures of Nixon shaking hands with a space alien, right? There has always been a market for misinformation. And the market for misinformation did not start with the internet. It didn't start with the internet. It migrated to the internet. And so, you know, there's a verse in the Bible that says that we should be as harmless as doves, but we should also be as, as wise as serpents. And we need to be very, very careful, and we need to be very, very wise about our consumption of information, and particularly about the information that we pass on to other people. I personally have actually come to believe that it's unethical for me to pass something along to other people unless I can verify it to be true. And I, I, I'm a Christian. I actually have a degree from Dallas Theological Seminary. And so I'm sort of stuck always thinking about things in terms of ethics and theology and, and Christian ethics. And I have come to believe that passing something along on social media that I don't know to be true is actually a form of gossip. And of course, we know that gossip is a sin. And so I've come to believe that sharing something on Facebook, sharing something on Twitter that I don't know to be true, that I can't verify to be true is actually a form of gossip. And so personally in my life, I have adopted an ethic that I will not pass things along to other people unless I can verify them to be true. Think about how much better off we would be right now if, if most people sort of adopted that same ethic, that I will not share something on Facebook or on Twitter. I will not send something to my email list unless I can verify it to be true, because otherwise that's a form of gossip. And I think for those of us who try to behave ethically, and for those of us who try to behave virtuously, uh, I think we need to start thinking in terms of the fact that passing along information that we don't know to be true is actually a form of gossip. And there's far too much of that that's going on today in our world. It's not just those of us who are Republicans and conservatives who do that. It happens among the progressives and the lefties too. This is just sort of my introduction to my talk tonight, because I think it's relevant to some of the things we're going to talk about. So one of the things that Glennis asked me to talk about was this issue of this case that was quote unquote before the Supreme Court, the Brunson versus Adams case where this gentleman Brunson uh, brought a legal case arguing that the election of 2020 was unconstitutional, that there were too many irregularities, that any member of Congress who voted to certify the election had violated their constitutional oath. And on many, many of these sort of unreliable right-wing websites, you saw stories where they were claiming that you may not be aware of this, but there's a case before the Supreme Court that could overturn the 2020 election. Uh, on the Western Journal website, here was the quote, the Brunson versus Adams case could overturn the election of 2020, throw out all of the legislators who voted to certify the results, 
leave them ineligible to ever run for office again and restore Donald Trump as the legitimate president of the United States. And a lot of people on the right have gotten all sort of wound up about this. They've gotten all excited about this. And part of the problem here is A, the unreliable sources, and B, a lack of civic understanding about how the Supreme Court works. So the first thing that, that everyone needs to understand about the Supreme Court is that lots and lots of cases make their way to the Supreme Court. Every week, almost every Monday during the Supreme Court term, they are faced with a list of somewhere between 30 and 50 cases that have made their way to the Supreme Court. And what the Supreme Court gets, they get together and they decide which of these cases should we hear. And they hear only a tiny fraction of those cases. Uh, if, if the Supreme Court is confronted with 30 or 40 cases, they might only hear one, of, they might only decide that one or two of those cases are worth hearing. And so this is called the Supreme Court granting cert or granting certiorari to the case. And what that means is that, the, that a sufficient number of the Supreme Court justices feel that that case has enough merit to actually be heard by the court. So the vast number of cases that make their way to the Supreme Court never actually get heard by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court dismisses the vast majority of those cases it's very important for people to understand that just because a case has made its way to the Supreme Court does not mean that it has merit. It doesn't mean that it has merit. It just means that the litigant is very, very persistent. All it means is that the litigant is very, very persistent. Uh, the litigant may have lost at every single level. The litigant may have lost at the district court level. The litigant may have lost at the federal appellate court level, but they just keep appealing and they keep appealing. So it makes its way to the Supreme Court. But there is no significance in the fact that a case makes it to the Supreme Court. All that means is that the litigant is persistent. What really matters is which cases does the Supreme Court grant cert for? So I researched this case of Brunson versus Adams. And in researching this case, it was very clear to me that there's almost no chance that the Supreme Court is going to agree to actually hear this case. There's almost no chance that the Supreme Court's actually going to grant cert because it's kind of a ridiculous case. And even if the Supreme Court decided to grant cert, they would only do so, again, in my estimation, to point out sort of the ridiculousness of the case. So I made all of this is funny to me anyway. I made all of these notes over the weekend about my presentation this evening to you. And then what do you know, but yesterday, January 9th, the Supreme Court decided to not grant cert to this case. So just as I sort of predicted and just as I was explaining in my notes in preparation for this talk, uh, I thought there was almost no chance that the Supreme Court would grant cert to this case. And in fact, they did not. Now, the reason that I did my whole talk earlier about you've got to be very careful about what sources you trust is specifically about this, because it was, it was obvious to me that this case was a ridiculous case that would never be heard. And in fact, that's what happened. The Supreme Court decided not to hear the case. But I know that there were conservatives all over the country who were victims of having been misled about this case because they saw something about it on social media. They saw something about it. Someone sent them an email about it and they got all torqued up and they got all worked up about it and they were misled. And people who were misled about this case, in my view, are victims. They're victims of, frankly, fake news. Donald Trump was exactly right when he talks about the problem of fake news. He was exactly right when he talks about the major media engaging in fake news and the major media having a bias against conservatives and a bias against the grassroots and a bias against Republicans. Donald Trump was exactly right about that. Unfortunately, the fake news problem also exists on the right. 
We also have a fake news problem on the right. We have people who they have figured out that they can get lots and lots of clicks by misleading people and by getting people worked up. And so this is why I said earlier that the greatest challenge of our time is becoming wise, sophisticated consumers of information and news. Because the websites that got people all torqued up about this case, this Brunson case, I guarantee you they're not running a story today about how the Supreme Court decided not to grant cert. I guarantee they're not following up on that because they're not in the business of being honest and accurate. They're in the business of getting clicks and keeping people torqued up. So please, please, I urge you, try to become a very sophisticated consumer of information. And please join me in my commitment to not pass along information that I can't verify to be true. Now, now I'm gonna to get to the part that Glennis wanted me to <laughs> really talk about which is the Supreme Court and its role in, in America's system and in, in our life. One of the reasons that it was crazy to think that the Supreme Court might take this Brunson case and overturn the 2020 election and somehow throw Joe Biden and Kamala Harris out and reinstate President Trump is that the Supreme Court is actually properly loathe to get involved in politics because politics is not within the realm of the Supreme Court. It's not within their purview. Uh, politics is really extra judicial. It really has nothing to do with the judicial system. Uh, when we look back at the 2020 election, uh, I am not a believer that the 2020 election was stolen. I'm not a believer that there was widespread fraud, but I am someone who believes that in every election, there's some level of fraud. And I happen to think that the state of Pennsylvania grossly violated their own laws when it came to the 2020 election. That literally the laws of the state of Pennsylvania did not allow the state of Pennsylvania to do some of the things that the state of Pennsylvania did. So the question then becomes, why does no one jump in and do anything about this? And the reason is that in our system, politics is not a judicial matter and politics is not a legislative matter. Politics is a separate area. And so if the citizens of the state of Pennsylvania are content for their state to have a corrupt political system, then the federal government really has nothing to say about that. The judicial branch really is unconcerned if the state of if the if the voters of the state of Pennsylvania are content with their state to have a broken corrupt electoral system that's up to the voters of Pennsylvania and the supreme court is not going to step in and rescue the voters of Pennsylvania the executive branch is not going to step in and rescue them the legislative branch is not going to step in and rescue them if if a state has a corrupt election system it's up to the voters of that state to do something about it. Now, the good news is since 2020, we've seen a number of states, mostly red states, who have enacted all sorts of elector, election reform. Georgia has, elected, has, has enacted significant election reform. Texas has enacted significant election reform. A number of other red states have as well. And that is the proper response. The proper response is for the states to set their houses in order. But in our federal system, remember, we don't have national elections. We, we kind of don't even have state elections. What we really have, most elections really happen at the county level and at the state level. And so if you've got problems in your state with elections, they have to be addressed, not judicially. They have to be addressed at the county level and at the state level. You cannot expect the Supreme Court to come in and rescue you from a state where the election laws are corrupt or where the system is corrupt. So it was always kind of silly to think that the Supreme Court would step in and overturn the results of an election. Now, some people will say, but isn't that what they did in Florida back during the George W. Bush election 
that was so close with Al Gore? And the answer is no, that's not what they did. What the Supreme Court did back then was they said Florida has to follow Florida's laws. And Florida's laws said that the recount had to stop. And it was the Democrats, it was the left who's trying to get the, the recount to go on and on and on indefinitely. And what the Supreme Court simply said was Florida has to follow Florida's laws. So you should disabuse yourself of the idea somehow that the courts are going to come in and rescue us from, from voting irregularities, um, uh, a state that doesn't follow its own election laws. That's not going to happen. The, the courts are never going to step in to do that. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the proper role of the courts in our system. And again, this is the part that Glennis likes, I know. And it's also one of my favorite talks to give as well. We operate today in the United States under something that's called judicial supremacy. We operate under the theory that the judicial branch is the supreme of the three branches. And because the Supreme Court is the Supreme Court, that the Supreme Court is really superior over the other two branches. This is how we operate today. Uh, a state will do something, but the state has no confidence that it will hold up unless the Supreme Court allows it. A president will do something, but a president has no confidence that that, that, that will be permitted unless the courts allow it. We operate today under a theory of judicial supremacy. The problem with that is that that is completely unconstitutional. In the Constitution, you, you, you've heard that we have three co-equal branches of government, and that is false. We, do, we have three separate branches of government, but they are not co-equal, and they were never intended to be co-equal. The Article I branch of government is the legislative branch. The branch of government in our system that is intended to be superior is the legislative branch, not the judicial branch. And so what makes me crazy, do you remember back in the early days of the Trump administration when, when President Trump put forth an executive order that said there will, be no, there will be no immigration from these nine countries that are known to be sources of terrorism? That was a perfectly valid and rational policy. And you had a single federal judge out in, I think, Washington State or something, who declared an injunction, who said, no, this is unconstitutional. And so the Trump administration threw up its hands and said, well, okay, we tried. The founders would roll over in their graves at the idea that a single judge somewhere could tie the hands of the executive branch. That is not constitutional at all, but it's how we operate today. Our system in the United States today is operating in a way that is fundamentally unconstitutional. The Supreme Court is not the final say on whether something is constitutional or not. Did you know that every member of Congress takes the exact same vow that Supreme Court justices take? They take exactly the same vow. The legislative branch has the same obligation to interpret and apply the Constitution that the judicial branch has. There's a reason why we refer to court decisions as opinions. They're opinions. There's a reason why the founders made sure that the judicial branch does not have the power to enforce its own decisions. Because the founders understood that if the judicial branch could enforce its decisions, that that would be the fastest path toward tyranny. And if you have ever sued someone and gotten a decision in court, you know that getting the decision from the court is only the first step. It doesn't mean you're going to be able to collect. Like if, if you sue a contractor or a builder and you win and you get like a decision for like $10,000 or something like that, the court doesn't go out and enforce that. The court doesn't go out and collect that for you because the courts have been deprived of the ability of the power to enforce their own decisions. And that was intentional on the part of the founders because the founders did not want the courts to become the superior branch of government. 
But in the way our system works today, the legislative branch has completely emasculated itself. The legislative branch passes laws like throwing mashed potatoes up against the wall. And it's like, well, we'll see what sticks. We'll see what the courts allow to stick. The states are the same way. The states pass laws, but they say, well, now we'll cross our fingers and hope that the Supreme Court allows this law to take effect. Our system, our constitution does not call for judicial supremacy. Decisions by the Supreme Court can be ignored by the rest of government. Now, that sounds radical probably to many of you. But let me just remind you that the Supreme Court found that Blacks did not count as 100% human. Was that correct? Should that have been ignored? The answer is yes. The Supreme Court found that Northern states were required to return runaway slaves. This was just prior to the Civil War. And the state of Massachusetts and the state of Wisconsin said, we are going to ignore this decision. And guess what happened to them? Nothing happened to them. Because the Supreme Court and the judicial branch do not have any power whatsoever to enforce their own decisions. They are not the superior branch of government. I'm very, very happy in the recent Supreme Court term that the Dobbs decision overturned Roe versus Wade. Roe versus Wade was a terrible decision. Even Justice Ginsburg, when she was alive, acknowledged that Roe versus Wade had been wrongly decided. And for 50 years, we had this bad precedent. So thank, I'm very, very thankful that the Dobbs decision overturned Roe versus Wade. But what if it had not? What if it had not? Think about this. The state of Alabama enacted a restriction on abortion. It went through the proper legislative process. It passed the Alabama House. It passed the Alabama Senate. It was signed by the Alabama governor. It was not overturned by the Alabama Supreme Court. What if the Supreme Court had not agreed with Alabama? What if the Supreme Court had upheld Roe v. Wade and had found that Alabama was wrong? In my view, Alabama should have ignored the Supreme Court. In my view, Alabama should have said, thank you very much for your opinion, but we're going to do this anyway. Now, that sounds radical to a lot of people because they think the Supreme Court is the superior over everything else, and they think the judicial branch is superior over everything else, and it's not. Now, I want to cut that short because I can see the time is getting away from me, and I want to talk to you about how to view the Supreme Court. And I also want to urge you all to have patience. Patience is a virtue, but patience is a virtue that is lacking these days on the right, and it's a virtue that is lacking among Republicans. The Democrats had complete control of Congress for over 40 years until 1994. The progressives had complete control over the Supreme Court for even longer than that. And it's going to take some time to unwind all of that. And so we need to be patient, those of us on the center right who want to see government limited, who want to see the Supreme Court reined in. It's going to take time, and we need to be patient. So I want to explain to you how I think about the current Supreme Court and the way I think you should think about the Supreme Court. Did you ever take one of those political quizzes where, like, like where are you politically? And if you, if you look at the chart, if you look at the graphic, there's more than one axis, right? It's too simple to think in terms of conservative versus progressive. That's too simple. If you think about politics, some people in politics are socially conservative, and they're also fiscally conservative, right? They believe in, they believe in 
social conservatism, but they also believe in economic conservatism. But some people are fiscally conservative, but they're socially liberal, right? And these days on the right, we have this sort of new thing where you actually have people who are socially conservative, but they're fiscally liberal. So it's too simple to try to categorize people as either you're either conservative or you're progressive. And it's, it's too simple to think of the Supreme Court that way as well. We certainly have a Supreme Court that is conservative. It's the first time in my lifetime, first time in your lifetime that we have a conservative Supreme Court. But then the question becomes, so why aren't we getting our way on everything, right? And the answer is that conservative versus progressive is only one way to think about the court. There are at least two other ways you need to think about the court. So you've got conservative versus progressive. That's one axis on the chart. But there's another axis. The other axis is activist versus restrained. Do we have an activist court or do we have a restrained court? An activist court is looking for opportunities to overturn bad precedent. A restrained court is saying we really should be very hesitant to overturn precedent. So if we go back to the Dobbs decision, if we go back to Roe v. Wade, remember that Chief Justice, um, shoot, why can I not remember his name all of a sudden? My mind's going blank. Uh, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court would not have overturned Dobbs completely. He would not have. Roberts. Roberts is a conservative, but he's not an activist. Roberts is a is believes in, in judicial restraint rather than judicial activism. Whereas Justice Alito and Justice Thomas are activists. So it's not enough to think in terms of conservative versus progressive. You also have to think about activist versus restrained. Is a particular justice actively looking for opportunities to overturn bad precedent? Or is a particular justice more restrained in their approach and, and is saying we should only overturn precedent when absolutely necessary? There's a third axis, there's a third way to think about the Supreme Court, and that is assertive versus deferential. Should the court be deferential to the government? Should the court be deferential to agencies? Or is the job of the court to be a bulwark against tyranny and a defender of human rights? Now, I would argue that for 40 plus years, we had a Supreme Court that was progressive, activist, and assertive. And that's why we got Roe. That's why we got forced busing. That's why we got same-sex marriage. That's why we got so many of these decisions imposed upon us, because the majority of the court was progressive, activist, and assertive. Today, we have a court that is conservative, but it's not necessarily activist, and it's not necessarily assertive. Uh, Justice Alito and Justice Thomas are very activists. They're eager to overturn bad precedent. Um, interestingly enough, Justice Gorsuch, Gorsuch and the new Biden nominee, Katanji Brown Jackson, they are assertive rather than deferential. They don't think that the courts should defer to government and to agencies. They think that it's the job of the court to be a bulwark that defends against individual rights. So this is why sometimes you'll see court decisions that are very odd combinations. Uh, when we see civil rights decisions, when we see criminal justice decisions, it's not going to be that unusual to see Justice Gorsuch siding with the, with the Democrats on the Supreme Court, because he is a conservative, but he also does not believe it's the court's job to be deferential to government, whereas Justice Roberts is conservative, but he does think it's the court's job to be deferential to government. So Justice Roberts frustrates us. He frustrates me because he doesn't always decide cases the way I think he should decide them, but that doesn't mean he's not conservative. He is conservative, but he's also 
restrained. He has a restrained vision for the role of the court. And that's not a bad thing. Uh, the worst thing is what we had for 40 plus years. The worst thing is when we had a court that was progressive, activist, and assertive. So thank God and thank Donald Trump for his appointments that we no longer have a Supreme Court that is progressive, activist, and assertive. But what may frustrate us sometimes is we do not have a Supreme Court that is conservative, activist, and assertive. We have a Supreme Court that is sometimes going to be restrained and is sometimes going to be deferential. And that's why we don't necessarily always get the answers that we like. For instance, Obamacare. Remember, Justice Roberts would not agree to overturn Obamacare. That doesn't mean he's not a conservative. He's a conservative. But it means he has a restrained and deferential view of the court. He does not think it's the court's job to fix what Congress screws up. He thinks it's Congress's job. And there's an argument to be made that that's a proper approach. So what I would urge you all to take away from my presentation today, I'm going to stop real quick, Glennis, I promise. Uh, what I would urge you to take away is that we have to stop viewing the court as the final say on things. The fact that we see the, the fact that our country operates as if the Supreme Court is the final say is why we get Supreme Court justices having their houses picketed. It's why we have demands by Democrats to pack the court because for 40 plus years, we've been operating as if the court is the final say. And literally five appointed, unelected, unaccountable judges can give you your way if you're a political activist. And much of the progressive agenda, much of the Democrat agenda over the past 40 years has not been, has not been put into place by legislation. It's been put into place by five progressive, activist, assertive Supreme Court justices imposing their view on the country. So thankfully, that's not where we are anymore. But you cannot expect to, to overturn 40 plus years of that kind of operation in a relatively short time. If, if we are blessed, if God blesses us with continued conservative Supreme Court justices, and if we are successful as a party in our election work, in making sure that Republicans control Congress and control the executive branch, uh, it will still take a long time to unwind all of the damage that's been done. But we have to be careful on the right that we don't fall into the same trap of thinking that we can use the Supreme Court to impose upon other people our view. That is not the job of the Supreme Court. In a self-governing people, the way the will of the people is expressed is not through court decisions. The way the will of a self-governing people is expressed is through legislation. And that's both at the federal level and at the state level. And Glennis, I will stop there. I know I went a little bit over time, but hopefully that was good. And hopefully that was useful. And hopefully we can get to other topics during the Q&A. I wish we had another hour. <laughs> um, I, I really do, because there's so much more that I, I wish you could speak to. Um, I, I like the fact that you brought up, we're not going to be able to undo 40 years of what we're used to overnight. That's something that we're going to have to retrain ourselves. And, and we are gonna have to retrain an entire country. I know for myself, um, I grew up believing three separate but equal branches of government. I know, I know, I know that's what I was taught in my parochial <laughs> private school that I went to. Um, and I was stunned when I found out that that's not what the founders intended. And when I went back and I started researching for myself, I was like, well, Gosh darn it, you're right. It, that's not the way it was meant to be. Um, so we have a real opportunity to educate our members and say, pass on what we've learned and, and open up their eyes to, to 
what the future can hold. But for one thing, we have to stop using the Supreme Court like a battering ram. If we can't win in the legislation, then we'll just turn it over to the courts and we're going to you know, we're going to beat them over here because we're going to pack the courts with conservatives. And now it doesn't matter what happens in the legislative side because we've got the courts on our side. That's not how it was supposed to work. So we have to, we, if, if the Constitution really means something to us, which we say it does, then are we not obligated to, to, do, to walk that walk? So um, one of the things um, that, that NFRW has picked up as a priority for us is um, seeking an amendment to, to uh, keep nine justices, is to keep nine amendments. Um, and I, I know there's more than one out there floating around, but we found one that we like. Um, honestly, I haven't read the other one, so I don't know why one is better than the other one. But um, just curiously, I know that during the last session, the last congressional session, that there was a bill introduced to expand the court to 13 justices. And I know that in the past, we've had both more than nine and less than nine. So I would, I'm just, if you could speak real quickly to, do you think there's any chance that a Keep Nine Amendment would pass at this point in time with the House majority and the Senate kind of stalemate. Where do you, where do you think we are now? I, I love, first of all, I love the idea of a constitutional amendment that locks the Supreme Court in. I think the founders expected us to amend the constitution for far more often than we have. Uh, really? Even though they made it difficult to do that. Well, I, I don't know that they made it difficult. I, I don't. I think it's our fault. I think it's a lack of imagination, frankly. Uh, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of the idea of the convention of the states. Okay. Um, I know that a lot of conservatives have been afraid of that, but it seems to. I really have come to the conclusion that the worst case scenario is actually where we are right now. I'm not really worried about the idea really? of a convention of the states going wrong because I think we are in we're in the timeline that is the worst case scenario right now. Oh gosh, so, that scares me to death. I, I think the founders intended for us to amend the Constitution much more often than we have. Mm -hmm. So I, I love the idea of amending the Constitution to lock yeah. in that the Supreme Court is nine members. And here's what I think is interesting: even even Justice Breyer has said. No, 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 don't pack the court. It really doesn't solve anything. Mm -hmm. It really creates an arms race to mm -hmm. where, you know, if, if, if the Democrats packed the court, then the next time Republicans had control, they would just pack the court again, right? right. And, and, and you're going to get, you get to a point where you have 72 people on the court, <laughs> right? And it, it doesn't solve anything. It doesn't make any, any sense. So I'm, I'm a big fan of that. And I'm a big fan of amending the Constitution in general. I think we're long overdue, frankly. Uh, Mark Levin uh, wrote a book a few years ago where he proposed several constitutional amendments. And I think I think that's a that's a great idea. I, I, I think that we have we it's a failure of imagination that we have not amended the Constitution more often than we have. Hmm. Oh, okay, now you got one. My little brain is just going off over here. And I think we might have to have you back to further this discussion. I can see it going in another direction now about- Well, you know, there's so many things we could do. You know, I, I, gave talk, or not. I, gave, I gave a talk to a Christmas banquet um, on this idea that if you, what is self-government? And if you really believe in self-government, then that, if you really believe in self-government, then you understand that the legislative branch is the most important branch. Right. And so while I'm delighted that we have a conservative Supreme Court, I think we've made a terrible mistake by putting all our eggs in one basket. Legislatures are far more important than the Supreme Court. And that, that is true at the state level as well as at the federal level. I don't, I don't know that it was all of our eggs in one basket as much as a, as a fail safe. I and mean, that's just well, it's a good point. I mean, I, th I think the reason yeah. President Trump was elected is that he made the commitment that he made about the Supreme Court. I think right. a lot of people that were hesitant about President Trump when he made that commitment, they came on board. 
And for all my frustrations with President Trump, that is my lasting gratitude toward him is that he kept that commitment. Yes. He, he, yes. The most important commitment that he made, he kept. That is true. That is very true. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay. I didn't see anything in the chat. Erica and Kim, did I miss anything? No, ma'am. There's nothing there. No. I'm going to like quiet tonight. Okay. I, well, I think we have a, a quick question, if you don't mind, Glennis. Sure. I don't know if anybody else had anything, but, um, and I just touch upon the beginning part of your conversation. You were talking about um, what people believe in, what they hear, what they, you know, not getting the truth and hear. The one thing that really always bothers me is conspiracy theories. And how do we get away from that? How do they get started? Is that very much the same as what you were talking about earlier because they gain traction and then people just take it and run with it just for news or what's your thought on that? It's real. It's really difficult. And, you know, I knew when I started talking about um, being careful about your sources, I knew that I was sort of opening up a, a Pandora's box there because it's really difficult. It's really difficult. But the, the problem with consp what, what conspiracy theories do is they, they give us something to cling to when things don't go the way we wanted them to go. And so, so for instance, with, with the, the purely rational data-based approach to the question of was the 2020 election stolen is pretty obvious. It's very clear that President Trump won the 2016 election by the skin of his teeth, and he lost the 2020 election by the skin of his teeth. And it, it's, it's, a, it's an indication of how closely split our country is. But there were people who felt like, well, if Trump lost, there has to have been some conspiracy. There has to have been some, something nefarious. And it's almost like they did you forget how closely the 2016 election was? You know, I remember watching TV in 2016. We all thought Hillary was going to win. And sometime around nine or 10 o'clock at night, it was like, holy cow. Trump might be able to pull off like an inside straight here. He might he might somehow be able to pull this together. And it was like 12,000 votes here. It was 18,000 votes there. And it was 20, 22,000 votes there. It was, it was like the tightest, tightest, um, most amazing thing that Trump won. It was extraordinary. So if you remember how close the 2016 election was, you shouldn't be surprised at how close the 2020 election was. But, but people, because they didn't want Biden to win, because they wanted Trump to win, people immediately assumed, well, there must be some conspiracy, there must be something nefarious or whatever. But, but again, if you just look at the data, the data is pretty obvious. You know what? The country's really closely split, split. He barely won in 2016. He barely lost in 2020. Mm -hmm. It's not really an indication of anything other than the fact of how closely split our country is. So people tend to cling to conspiracy theories because they're comforting, because it they, they, they tells them that they weren't wrong. Here's the thing, though. As a as a Christian who believes in sin and, and, and total depravity and all that kind of stuff, I totally understand that I'm going to be wrong a lot of the time. I, it doesn't disturb me to be wrong, and it doesn't disturb me that sometimes the world goes in a direction other than the direction I would prefer. But that doesn't mean some injustice has been committed. It just doesn't mean that some injustices have been committed. And there's more evidence that Lyndon Johnson stole his election than there is that Joe Biden stole his election, and there's more. There's more evidence, frankly, that JFK stole his election over over uh, Richard Nixon than there is that Biden stole his election. So, I and, and part of the thing for me is if if you really do believe that the legislative branch is the most important branch, frankly, it shouldn't be that important who the president is. I think too often, too often we behave as if we think we have a parliamentary system. We don't have a parliamentary system. The, the, the power of the presidency is significantly limited. When, when people run for president and they promise, if, if you elect me, I'm going to do these 12 things. No, they're not. No, they're well, not. It's supposed to be, but right. look at all the they're not going orders. to do those things. Look it, at all the executive orders that, we, that we're dealing with now. I mean, 
I know right, that's but, a, I know it's a subject for another day, but but look how quickly they're reversed. Government has gone crazy. I mean, here's here's what I what I challenge people to do is look at Obamacare. Okay, Obamacare was done through legislation, and look how hard it's been to get rid of. Your real lasting policy impact is done through legislation. It's not done through court decisions. It's not done through executive orders. It's done through legislation. And that is that is appropriate. You know, we just had this we just, in Congress just passed before the end of the year, the Defense of Marriage Act, where they where they passed into law same sex marriage protections. Now, I'm not wild about same sex marriage, frankly. But if you're going to do it, that's how it's supposed to be done. It's supposed to be if you're going to do it, you do it through legislation. You don't do it through Supreme Court decisions. You don't do it through executive orders. You do it through legislation. If we are a self-governing people, the way a self-governing people govern themselves is through legislation. And legislation turns out to be far more persistent and far harder to overturn than executive orders and court decisions. And that is how it ought to be. That is true. Thank you so much, Tom. You are a wealth of information as always. And I know I say this every time we talk, but I could listen to you for days. Um, I, I really, it's, it's so interesting. And I may just call you and ask you to come on again because I am I'm just percolating ideas over here on, on different subjects. That well, Glynis, Glynis, I, I have the utmost respect for, for your organization. I have the utmost respect for NFR, NFRW. <laughs> And the, and the state chapters and anything that IPI can do to serve you folks, we are always more than happy to do because I have the utmost respect for what you folks do. Thank you very much. I do appreciate that. I hope all of you ladies enjoyed this month's Empower Hour. Please join me next month, um, Tuesday, February 14th, when we talk about how to make a difference when you live in a blue state. Um, I know that's going to be very interesting for those of you who are not as lucky as I am to live in Texas. Um, so we've got some experts on the line that know a little bit about that and they will be here to talk to us about how to be empowered and um, to really make a difference because we can, we can do more than just survive, we can thrive and we always do because we're women and, and that's our job. So thank you much for joining me and I'll see you next month on February 14th. Ciao.